And we are live. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, those viewing with us live on Facebook, um, those who will also view our recorded video. Tonight's topic on community conversations on race will be about um, the API and Native American Pacific Islander um, community um, on the topics of mental health and intersectionality. We'd also like to take this time to acknowledge that tomorrow, May 25th, will be the death anniversary of George Floyd. We would like to take um, this moment of silence to honor and remember his memory. Thank you. The STOP API movement have, would probably never have not been possible without Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter all, always. And we continue to be inspired you know, by this powerful, peaceful um, fight for equity and equality and for this whole movement proud to be a, uh, uh, an Asian for Black Lives. And we stand in solidarity. My name is Elizabeth Escalante, and I use the pronouns she, her, or xia, which is also um, gender neutral in Tagalog. And I would like to introduce you to the rest of our panelists. And each of our panelists will um, give you um, please give a short bio and discuss um, why you're taking a part in this conversation. Sara, um, let's let's start with you. All right. Uh, my name is Sara Durant Kasmuth. I am a first generation uh, Asian American, specifically Chinese Malay, and I use a them uh, or dia uh, uh, pronouns. That's the uh, Malay Indonesian one. Um, and that just means that uh, I, you know, I identify as non-binary. Uh, I am not a man. I'm not a woman, uh, and I feel most respected and seen when people use they and them for me. Uh, and I've been an organizer uh, in the community for uh, about five years, starting out in Santa Cruz, um, where I lived for several years, and then I moved here in 2019, right in time for the fires, uh, and shortly thereafter got involved uh, in tenant organizing uh, and then you know more recently in uh, Asian organizing and I've got a project coming up that I cannot tell you all about. So exciting. M? Hi, my name is Emerson Robles Tuttle or M. Uh, I use they them pronouns. I am a Filipino American uh, living in Sonoma County. Um, I graduated from Sonoma State University at uh, in 2019 uh, with a liberal studies degree. And for the last year, I've been working with um, community organizations, um, working on uh, just public demonstrations um, in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Thank you. Oops, and then next we have Kim. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Ledesma. I am uh, many things. Uh, among them, I'm a former business owner. I'm a mother. I'm a community outreach worker. Uh, I specialize in education and food distribution. Um, I am a, a graduate of San Francisco State University and Five Branches Institute in Santa Cruz in acupuncture. I um, grew up in San Francisco. I am the child of an Afro Puerto Rican father and a Chinese, Irish, Hawaiian, and Portuguese mother. Uh, I spent long summers in Hawaii and um, I am white passing and have had to code switch my entire life. And um, I'm the mom of a non binary child, proudly, uh, who is a community outreach worker and uh, another who's a student going to. Um, CSU Long Beach in the fall. 
Thank you. Brian. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Brian Prostowski. Um, I think maybe that's why I was invited to join you all, uh, because tonight we're talking also a little bit about mental health. Uh, so maybe I could bring that, um, uh, I guess, angle to the conversation. Um, like M, I'm also uh, half Filipino and half Caucasian. I when uh, when they told me that, I was uh, very excited. <laughs> the concept of, as you mentioned, kind of intersectionality. I, I know that I had heard a little bit of a piece about it, as as I've been learning quite a bit too through these community conversations about um, how you kind of. Uh, um, navigate when there are multiple complex layers of um, trying to figure out where you fit in. <laughs> uh, I, I often struggle with that being half Caucasian and, and, and half Filipino where I can, as to use Kim's term, code switch for what is most convenient for the moment and what people uh, most like. And so I think with regard to um, the uh, conversation on race, I think that it's um, helpful to kind of have a lot of mixed up people uh, so that we can <laughs> all bring a little bit of that uh, perspective together where um, folks who don't sort of have that experience may not necessarily um, look at race in that same kind of way. It's not as simple as uh, black, white, or brown when you have so many different things converging at once. Um, I'm so excited to hear what you all have to say and uh, just proud to be included. Uh, so thank you for including me and particularly on this um, eve of uh, George Floyd's death. I think that all of us are excited in, in some ways to um, kind of really uh, make sure that we um, just uh, honor the uh, uh, just the experience of all that for so many people um, and, and, and where we are and where we go from here, particularly for the AAPI community, as Mick Sara said, it's, it's such a big deal for us to have space to have a conversation like this. I don't think AAPI had even been something in the clear public view until recently as of Atlanta. So I'm glad to be a part of that. Thank you for including me. Of course, Brian, you're always welcome. So I'll, actually, most of our panelists have um, given us a great definition of what is intersectionality or um, examples of that. With intersectionality, when we present ourselves to others, we don't, there are a lot of layers to us that gives us our own identity. Intersectionality um, can cross between ethnicity, race, and um, gender identity, and many more. For So example, like for myself, I identify as um, Filipino American. Um, I am a woman and, um, and that's uh, at least like where like, you know, where those, those intersections that I can think of immediately cross for me. Um, and then we're also, so we also use that, um, that acronym, AAPI, Asian American and Pacific Islander, um, and also including, um, including this into the acronym as AANHPI, which stands for Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. We'll start with our first question. And let's start off um, with talking about mental health and what it means to you and the stigmas, um, the stigmas or the difficulties surrounding mental health, specifically within the AA and HPI community. Um, M, I would like to start with you. Absolutely. Um, so for the first part of that question, um, what it means, what mental health to me um, means, it's, it's, to, it's to take a pause um, in a constantly racing mind um, because we are, we're just constantly going, um, even in, even in sleep, that's really one of the only ways that we're not like, it's not whatever's happening in our day to day is not at the forefront of our mind. And we can actually take that rest mentally. Um, 
and taking care of your mental health is a lot. Um, it can look like going to therapy. It can look as easy as just having a nice cup of tea or just sitting with yourself even. Um, I, um, you know, when it comes to stigma around mental health, um, specifically in our communities, um, I think for a lot of minority groups, especially in America, um, there's a lack of complete trust in the healthcare system. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, folks didn't have, folks and generations that were coming in uh, to the US didn't, um, weren't fully accepted uh, when they first got here. And they weren't really given options as to what was available to them. Even today, there's a lot of need to advocate consistently for yourself. And that comes from a, that comes from a lack of um, healthcare providers, you know, not believing in what we're saying to them, um, dismissing our concerns, and oftentimes not even letting us know what options are available to us. Um, like what good mental health and self-care is supposed to look like. We're not entirely sure what that is. So, you know, I think, I think it goes without saying a lot of, uh, a lot of minority groups in America, if not all of them, um, have a little bit of a hesitancy um, when it comes to mental health. Absolutely. Sarah. Yeah, actually just thinking about that, um, like there's not really a picture, uh, I think of, of Asians that, uh, you know, are healthy in that way that aren't like constantly going, 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 uh, that aren't on this like hamster wheel of capitalism and can take time and rest and are intentional about that. Um, you know, it's, it's, one of like the extremes of like uh you know the monk who's everything is measured or the like hard working uh stereotypical model minority asian um where you know those are the images that we're given that we see for ourselves the way that we understand ourselves and it's such a a, a pervasive thing i think like I've never really experienced stigma around mental health in my families um but I definitely get a lot of messaging from like the world of like you know you have to work harder than everybody else and I actually don't think that that's like necessarily just in my head I think that like it's it's harder for us to be recognized um because people have that same image of us um like if you pick like when I thought about this, I couldn't picture Asians in, in workplaces other than like doctors, dentists, uh, you know, like those are the professions that people see us in. And it's actually really hard for us to succeed in other areas because I just don't think we're like seen in that way. Uh, oh, there's like one more thing that I think is really important to this. I was like gaslighting myself around this um, where like, I was like, I don't, I don't really face discrimination as an Asian because I don't look Asian. And then I realized like, oh, like Southeast Asians are the, like the uh, way on average, like lower income than, uh, than Eastern Asians or South Asians. Uh, and like, I, I look like that. <laughs> And that doesn't look like what people picture as Asian. Um, so I think that's a whole other area of like mental health, the story that we tell about ourselves and the way that we see ourselves. Um, it, it's it, like, we have a lot of Southeast Asians here and that's unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, two, three, actually four to all, almost all, yeah, all of us. And um, you know, definitely so with the model minority myth, the damaging, um, the damaging nature of that and the higher expectations held for us. Um, Brian, um, you're up. Um, man, uh, so there was this band that I learned about from TV. Did you guys see that, like the Linda Lindas? Did you guys yeah. see that? Oh my goodness. Grace. 
sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, speaking of like the concept of like what's allowed for like you know an Asian in in the public like view, and it's like it's like badass like teenage middle school girls just like really just letting loose what it is that I think uh and I, I don't know if that's an LA thing or if that's like a generational thing or like what the permission is that they get to break the mold but it was so it's like so unusual like Mixar was mentioning it's like so unusual for particularly for you know like I'm like wearing this white coat you know speaking of like image of like what, what an Asian parent would be proud of with their kid or something um I feel like um it's tough it's tough the expectations are, are no joke and um for certain families and even internally at some point you start to just kind of like um expect that sort of um even the monks you know Saro was saying like the monks, even the monks were like excellent at being monks. <laughs> like, there's no like room for like an A minus monk, you know? Like, so functionally, uh, I, I think that hamster wheel of competition and, and expectations, it makes it very difficult, I think, um, in terms of mental health to, to get that pause, I think that M was mentioning. I mean, I think we all need that clearly um we all need that i think to to continue to do the, the work that we care about and what we do but man when i when i heard the linda linda's this weekend i was like yes <laughs> that person can speak for me a little bit because uh, i'm not brave enough in some ways to be that person you know to just be like this is what it feels like sometimes to have somebody like in a racist way just like come up to you and be like, I'm supposed to be afraid of you. And you being like, wait, you're supposed to be afraid of me? You know, it's sort of like, and then just screaming about it in like punk rock Asian style, which I just like have never heard of. Anyways, I, I it's like, I can't get racist sexist boy out of my head. And I think it kind of, it sort of speaks to what I think we're all kind of trying to say. It's just how, how do you find space to, to uh, or that pause as Em was saying and as Sarah was saying, but. Kim, as a mama, maybe you could tell us. <laughs> what uh, well, I was going to offer doing? another band um, uh, because I'm, I'm older than all of y'all. Uh, Shonen Knife, uh, the trio of uh, Japanese women that um, kill it. So look them up, Shonen Knife. Um, I want to talk about intergenerational trauma, seeing as how I'm a little older and um, my mother was alive for Pearl Harbor. And her generation, um, whether they came from Hawaii or uh, other countries that were war torn in, in the 20th century, Korea, Vietnam, China, Japan, Okinawa, um, these people withstood war. And that brings with it um, reflexes and behavioral changes uh, that get passed on, frankly. Um, and so some of their concerns, you know, I, I heard about and carry with me. Uh, so the stigma also of being out of control, which being emotional can um, be, an, you know, it's, it's misunderstood as. Uh, and those generations did not seek therapy. There was no it wasn't in their vocabulary, and yet um, they carried it with them. And and I certainly saw the damage that it caused. Um, so uh, I, I sought therapy in my lifetime, and when I finally was able to express that to my parent, their answer was, "Well, you, you mean you can't handle your own problems?" And I said, uh, "Nope, nope, I can't." And and it was. Um, shocking for for both myself and and the person I expressed it to to be frank about that sort of thing so I think the stigma of just carrying it within you and you have to carry on because you're disrespecting your elders if you if you exude anything that is mistaken as weakness and um, our need for 
for assistance with our mental health is sometimes seen that way. So um, I just offer that up as a perspective that um, I certainly have had the experience of. Yeah, an enlightening, um, you know, perspective too, I might say. Um, and it's that reminder that we, you know, every individual can only handle so much um, within their own capacity, regardless of, you know, how, you know, how their predecessors have handled, you know, any other calamities or, or struggles. Right, right. Uh, the, you know, epigenetic changes, maybe Brian can speak to that, that those stresses that you experience, particularly women, there are changes that get passed on through the placenta to the next generation. Um, I, and I don't think, you know, I think a lot of people who've withstood trauma, I think of our African-American uh, community, 400 years of what these people have gone through um, and the health issues that come up as a result. It's, it's, it all matters, it's, it all matters. Yeah, this morning I was, I was hearing something about Tulsa. I don't know if that's it's the anniversary also of that massacre functionally. You know, I keep using those words that are so intense, but um, I, I always remember when I was training, Kim, there was like this um, single celled organism that um, they did these studies on to show the impact of trauma on its development and the, the what it looked like after kind of like a um, traumatic pregnancy looked super different than what, and I, I know it's we're more compli complex than a single cell organism, but functionally it's not surprising. Even I think uh, one of the things that we do in our office frequently now with regard to mental health, just to kind of um, speak to this, um, the impact of trauma on your physical health even uh, is that uh, we do these screens, they call them the adverse childhood events screen or the ACEs screen. It's a really kind of well-known, it was a big Kaiser study initially. Um, and uh, you almost like the, the conclusions of the screens are that they, they sort of ask you about what are your social stressors? And um, almost under the assumption that when your social stressors exceed a certain point, um, uh, you, you actually can't work on like managing chronic diseases effectively. So like we have like great medications. I know that we, you, um, M, you and, and, and Sarah had, had mentioned trust in the healthcare system, but for somebody who lives in that, in that system and believes a little bit of like just the impact of some of the um, benefits of some of the pharmaceuticals when it's the right patient. When, anyways, let's just say like asthma, for example, like uh, you can do everything in, correctly in terms of medications, but if you don't address somebody's trauma, you actually can't manage their asthma. It's amazing. Like the outcomes of the study where it's basically like you, you try to just throw meds at people and that's not, that's not, um, it's actually not what's in people's best health interests. So like the mental health and the connection to the, the ability to, to be healthy in terms of physical health is, is there's plenty of data to show that. So as you're saying, this kind of like intergenerational trauma and thinking of that like single celled organism of how the epigenetic impact moving forward to us is now, you know, we kind of continue these, I don't even, I don't, it's probably not even safe. It's probably not fair to call them bad habits. It's just like the, the routine of what it is that we're like that, that concept of like an Asian parent expecting very um, unrealistic things of their Asian children. Like, why is that so normal? It's a kind of, uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, that's what I'm like, so I'm so happy to be here. I just feel like I'm a dad. I've got two kids, but Kim is like, you know, just brings in this amazing mama perspective, which I always feel like, I mean, you were mentioning elders and how seeing, seeking mental health is disrespectful because it shows weakness to the elders in our community. And as Asians, I mean, all of us, I'm sure could speak to how much we value, like um, res being respectful of elders. It's like, it's almost more important than our own identities. So it's, it's a really big deal to think that we can't seek out our own care uh, if it's gonna be disrespectful. Anyways. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Sara, um, at our prep meeting, you said the relationship to identity is complicated and messy when you are mixed. Can you speak on that? And, uh, and then I would love to hear from everyone else too. Yeah, so I, I actually really 
love that I've come around to really loving the fact that I'm I'm of mixed race. Uh, and I don't think I really had that much of a concept of it when I was a kid. I would just like, I would recite this formula of like, I'm half Malay, a quarter Chinese and a quarter white. And it had no real meaning to me in that formula, but like, I definitely identify with being Malay and I definitely identify with being Chinese. I don't really have a connection to whiteness because I never knew my grandfather, um, like emotional connectedness. Uh, and and so like the way that I walk through the world is um, it's not that formula. And one of the really amazing things and, and something that I, I you know, discovered like a couple of years ago, I went to uh, like a, a training where we broke out into like identity groups and we've done this before uh, of like, you know, you have a, a white caucus, which I, I hear is really awkward. Uh, you have like the POC caucus. That's usually how we break the group up to just like discuss different issues. And this, this one time we, we, we did a mixed race caucus and that was like life changing um because we you know we we came around this table it's like only like I think like nine ten of us and we started sharing stories and like this like black Chinese woman was like telling my story <laughs> and it was like you know like a half black half Polish man like understood everything about like what it means to be <laughs> like my mix he understood uh, and it just like around the table, every single one of us had all of the same experiences in terms of just that, like not quite fitting in that always feeling pretty lonely, being the only one all of the time. Uh, like I am the only one in the United States. I'm the only one all of the time. Uh, like I don't like the number of times that I've met a Malaysian in the States that wasn't at a Malay restaurant is like a couple of times uh and that's just like that one like side uh and so i really have come to identify as being mixed race in a way like it's it's its own thing like you're not a, a formula of the things that you're made up of like i am like i am malay and i am chinese and um when we were talking about it, I was just kind of thinking like, okay, what, what ancestors are in the room with me right now? <laughs> like, is, is kind of the way that I, I, I have come to conceptualize that is like, who am I in this moment? Um, and it's like, just like this, I, this thing about being mixed um, that I think y'all will probably relate to. That's all of us. We're all mixed. Cool. <laughs> Kim. Well, being from Hawaii, um, which I invite all of, all, all of my mixed brethren to visit because we're everything all the time. Being hapa, which means half, is um, the legacy of colonialism on the island. And it makes for beautiful children um, of all, just every rainbow color. And um, uh, I bump, being white passing, I have bumped into people who think they can have prejudiced conversations with me and then they'll ask me if I'm German and or, you know or some kind of European uh, background and then I just kind of spout out you know no and this is what I am and usually it causes great embarrassment which is a-okay -okay with me in the moment um, but really to understand where I come from uh, is to understand how these cultures arrive and um, I, I had said it in our pre-meeting that we are much more than Mai Tais and grass skirts. It's complicated, our history. Um, it, it is brutal in many forms, but um, it, a history of colonization, labor exploitation, religious indoctrination, and land theft. So, you know, that's, um, can't put that on a brochure, but it exists. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I invite I anybody watching this to delve into the history of Hawaii. Um, it is deep and complicated, and we are a loving people 
but we have um, a lot of reasons to not be happy-go-lucky. Uh, Brian. Oh, uh, well, uh, Sarah had posted this. Uh, I think I'm going to say from now on when people ask me, like, but what are you really like you had posted on <laughs> I'm just gonna say I'm mixed race. I, I feel like it's a, I had never, I don't think anybody's ever, well, it just, I guess it just takes one to know one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of what that experience was. It's just like, oh, like mixed race people understand mixed race people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, you know it's a, there, you had, you had posted something in the AA. We have like, we're lucky enough to have this like Asian American Pacific Islander, but. Maybe we need to add in the native Hawaiian letters. Uh, uh, Facebook group, and, and you had said something on here about like, it's like this picture, it said like types of mixed Asian writing. I saved the picture. I, I'm one of those save picture people. And um, it had all these like phrases on here that I was like, man, I say all those things. I don't belong. I don't belong anywhere at any time, period. I'm mixed race and I got all, uh, and all I got were these lousy microaggressions. It's like all, <laughs> all these things that I'm just like, yeah, seriously, I will never belong anywhere. But it's nice to meet other people who feel the same way, you know, that what are you, but what are you really question? That was like the, that's the one that I think a lot of us are, uh, I think maybe unfortunately used to, um, and the, the, the other box, that was the last one, you know, type other, or check other, both. Um, but um, it's, it's like it's, a non-binary <laughs> like race <laughs> add add exactly add all of the all the others <laughs> just like if there could be like one other box so they could just be like you know just just to apply to all categories then that kind of but i i like the idea i feel like from now i'm going to try that sorry i'm going to try that like uh, people ask me well, but what are you i'm just gonna say i'm mixed race yeah that yeah. other box definitely bothers me too uh m <laughs> Yeah, the other the other box just, I mean, it quite literally places you as you you weren't thought of enough. So we didn't know like what to put here. We didn't anticipate there would be others, except we did. But we're not gonna we're gonna do the absolute bare minimum for it. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to just um, if I'm on a paper form, I'll just cross out like male and female, and I'll just put non-binary. I'll make my own box. I'll check it, because what are they gonna do? Also. Why do you need that information? Um, I really question it. Um, you know, Brian, something that I, I really wanted to highlight with this call too, um, with being mixed race is that we are of the same makeup kind of, you know, you're half Caucasian, I'm also half Caucasian and Filipino, and we do not look anything alike. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, it's, having the mixed race experience growing up it really made it difficult at least for me personally just um to really feel like there was um a specific box that I could place myself in so that I could feel comfortable knowing okay this is what I'm supposed to do this is what I'm supposed to be this is what I can do because that's the easy route but really you know we're um you know mixed race folks or multiracial folks we are paving a whole lot of ground um, uh, for all of the generations to come uh, beyond us. Um, the, are, is anyone here familiar with racial imposter syndrome? Did anyone know that? Um, I mean, the words make sense. <laughs> yeah, I've only heard of the name, but I, I don't know much more. Yeah, I, I only recently came across it maybe couple months ago because I was really I was really struggling trying to figure out like what the heck am I um and along along a, a whole journey of trying to um connect with my Filipino roots and you know what I what I found was you know there's a lot of mixed race folks that just they um to use Kim's term of code switching they uh just they don't feel like they're entirely one thing they don't feel enough or that they can speak to a specific um, uh, topic. So like community conversations on race, honestly, I was really hesitant because it's just like, I, I know that culturally growing up, I had a lot of Filipino influence, but I have always been told that I don't look Filipino and I've always gotten like Middle Eastern 
or, you know, when I was working at a bar, um, folks would come up and they'd speak Spanish to me and I had to just be like, I'm so sorry, I don't know. I, um, I, but the uh, racial imposter syndrome is, is quite literally just the feeling of uh, not, uh, not fully trusting um, your own identity, um, despite you knowing that that's what you are and that's who you are. Um, one of the podcasts that I came across, if I can, if I can find it in a sec, I'll, I'll share it with you all after, um, talked about how there's actually a mass gathering, um, you know, pre COVID, um, silly little pandemic, um, out in SoCal where, uh, you know, it's the largest gathering of multiracial, uh, mixed ethnicity groups. And they just, they just talk about it. They go into focus groups and they go and they talk about what it's like to be multiracial. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I can SoCal? See, I can, I, if I remember right, yeah, it's in SoCal. It's in LA. Oh, SoCal. <laughs> not SoCal. SoCal. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was God. like, I lived near there. Yeah, I thought I had never thought this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so just like, to clarify, have you had like white people tell you that you're not Asian? Yes. I have too. You know, there was a, uh, there was a, sorry, you were at the Filipino potluck that we tried to hold. Um, yeah. Yes. And it there were, great. there were, it was great. There a were, little. did you know though, that there were only four Filipinos that really showed up? Um, also nobody else brought food. It was a potluck. Where, oh, what, no, what they you, brought what bread. You <laughs> um, but you know, culturally four Filipinos, that's all it took to feed everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so um you know there was there was a kid that came up uh to uh to and asked if he could just take a plate and um I asked him if he knew what kind of food it was and he said no but can I have a spring roll and I told him it's Filipino and he asked me what is a Filipino um and you know like I <laughs> we're I, I think Filipinos are like, they're, they make up like one third of um, most Asian minorities in California alone. Like we, we're, we're huge out here. Um, but, you know, I guess, I guess we're not as visible as you would think. Um, you know, um, am I, I'm, I was born in the Philippines. I, Elizabeth, I'm not sure if I, I told you that, but, um, and I don't speak Tagalog. My parents, it was like never a priority. I think uh, in the Philippines, the people go to school in English, um, but I don't speak any dialects or whatnot. And I, I still, I keep telling myself I'm going to learn. It's a Rosetta Stone thing or something someday. Um, but I've never felt more um, like other than when I went to the Philippines to visit my grandmother um, at we went to go, she was a university professor and uh, we went to the tour when she was a little bit younger. And, um, and uh, when I, uh, I was there like, oh no, he's American. He's not Filipino. And I was like, oh man, I don't fit in anywhere. <laughs> so it kind of go, it kind of goes both ways depending on where you're at. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I can, you know, tell you like a whole story on that too, even. Um, I myself struggled with that. Um, living in the Philippines, I, I went to high school there, um, you know, for four and a half years. And it's really just an interesting dynamic um, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, so our next question, um, Kim, we're so fortunate to have you, um, you know, with your unique perspective as part of this conversation. And can you tell us a little bit about your culture and how as a parent of a non-binary child, do you feel your culture impacted the beautiful way you have embraced them? Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, um, like you all, for us Asians, you know, food and family are our big deals. We love our children, um, and so it's a big part of our life. Um, and as for being Hawaiian, we have a whole understanding of what is loosely termed as the third gender, and that is mahu culture. Um, you know, we don't, it's, well, for, for all the non-binary folks out there, that's something to look into. But basically, Mahu is considered the people in the middle who 
um, can be gay or bi or trans. We don't really differentiate those things. Um, we feel as though each of us come in with both what would Western terms feminine or male traits. And that blending is complicated. It's not, it doesn't fall into a single bucket that each of us is an individual and we come in with our own unique traits of both those polar up ends. Um, and so we don't even have a gendered pronoun in our language. Um, we have me, which is um, Oban. We have you, Ooi. And then we have whoever else, she, she, it. Uh, is is oh yeah, and so um, that's I think language gives you an indication of a culture, and so um, that's an indication of how we feel. We walk in the spirit of Aloha, um, and that engenders faith, time, political views, color, creed. It's a respect for each other as individuals, and that even transcends to our environment. So uh, for me, I, I feel like, are you a good person? That's the measure of, of who I raise. And, um, and Noah is fantastic. And I would, I would not want them to be squelched into um, feeling that they had to be somebody else, that they couldn't be their authentic self. That, that, um, that's not the way I was raised. Uh, I have non-binary relatives and the only people who gave them a hard time were those of my family who frankly bought into organized religion. Um, whether it be Catholicism or Mormonism, and those those people were shunned. And it was my mother who would talk to their parents and, and they opened up to my mom before they could open up to their own parents. And we would advocate to these people that this is unacceptable to not love your children or shun them or pretend that these, these lines that they had been said we're real because we have a whole history where we have coexisted um, with each other. There's no, no, you know, there's no place for it. It's, it, it, it does, it gets in the way of, of fun and family, frankly. So um, I just, uh, I have strong views on it, as you can tell, but there's, there's no reason why these people cannot be treated any less or any differently, you know? So that's my, my take on it. Uh, that pronoun is Ia? Oh, Ia. Oh, Ia. Ah. Oh, it's got an Okina, which is a glottal stop. Oh, Ia. Oh, Ia. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just thought it was interesting because uh, uh, Sha, is that it? Mm -hmm. and yeah like yeah. like the they're all like gender neutral and that's just like an interesting thing about uh asian languages is that they tend to uh actually have like you know little to no gender in the language itself that that's actually something that comes from europe mm -hmm. um like a lot of the concepts around gender being so rigid like that is that is a very european thing yeah. uh and yeah, it, that whole thing about the uh, the language of a people will tell you a lot about the people is like so true. Um, yeah. yeah, my with my Chinese family, it is more important to know the the order of your birth. <laughs> so if you were the first child, you are no, you're number one. You know, I had an auntie Yit in Cantonese. I I never knew her real name. Because she was anti number one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that you know, Yit being the number one in Cantonese. So um, I, you know, to think about it, I 
don't think I ever knew her real name. So that birth order was much more important. And I mean, sometimes I wish I could use that with my own children. I spout all kinds of names before I get to their actual name. <laughs> you know? So yeah, language tells you a lot about a culture. That's for sure. It sure does, especially with Tagalog that has been, um, well, colonized by Spain for 333 years. So you do see a lot of that, um, even within our own language. Uh, Brian, you are a pediatrician and uh, much of your perspective comes from the lens of a healthcare professional. The last year has been a true test for mental health um, that has left us questioning who we are and what we care about. Can you speak on what this has meant specifically for the AANHPI community? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks Elizabeth. I, I feel like we, we kind of touched a little bit on this. I feel like this is a little bit of like uncharted territory in some ways um, as we were kind of uh, talking about expectations and um, like, uh, like what is, who, who goes to therapy? You know, it's sort of, uh, or how do we even acknowledge that um, mental health exists or even that like, um, <laughs> that we could do anything about it. Um, I, I'm a, as a pediatrician, so I'm, I'm mostly taking care of kids. So it's a little bit of like this next generation, which gives me um, a little bit of uh, more of that permission of the like racist, sexist boy generation. Um, so that, that helps a little, I think, with regard to um, permission to kind of breach, broach the conversation. Um, but I, I still feel like there's there's a lot of stigma, and um, this last year I think a lot of us have kind of thought about just um, it's like a stress test on our society. Uh, she's like <laughs> boring medical phrase, um, just to help us really navigate because it's almost like a mental health anguish and. And, and depression and isolation, it was just normal this last year. And, and that sort of acceptability to, um, I think where that really showed with my patients, but even um, in, in some ways for um, our community, um, whether it be mixed race or, or um, AANHPI, I think is that um, it was just so normal, like mental health suddenly became normal. And I think that uh, like the, the, the issues as far as like isolation and depression with particularly with school being out, I think that it gave um, a lot of people permission to be like, man, this is so isolating and how do we navigate this? And then it was like affecting grades. <laughs> then like, I, I don't know if the Asian parents have permission to kind of actually like address this because we don't want kids to get lower grades or whatever. Um, but but every visit that I had this last year, um, it, 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 it was a little bit less of that divide, I think, from historically between like the, the who goes to therapy and who's permitted to go to therapy. And the fact that just there was just a very broad um, acknowledgement that this has been a, a really, the pandemic has brought up a lot of really underlying mental health isolation issues that um, and that, that it just became a little bit more normal so that people could start to actually have uh, conversations and uh, it was fascinating. Uh, some some therapists had had sort of disclosed to me to some extent that a lot of really put together families, or maybe let's just sort of like um, categorize. Um, I don't know, maybe just to use grades as a bad example. Like kids who were getting straight A's reached their tipping point around the holidays, and um, a lot of the mental health professionals had said to me like, "People were hanging in there. They were really hanging in there," and then when it got to be like family time, particularly as, you know, Kim was very clearly saying, you know, food and family and, and fun, but food and family is like a big deal, particularly around the holidays when there wasn't that opportunity, I think everybody lost it. And, um, and then in January, this whole 2021 year has been just a, a mess. I have kids, I literally have, I'm sure you guys, you all feel in your interactions with people as well. Like um, there's, there's a point at which people can't, it's like beyond it's it's beyond that sort of like uh what's acceptable and what's not and it's, it gets more desperate and almost every day um there's a, a teen who I, I see in my office uh who um is crying 
and with their parent. I try to have the parents be together with them. And it's, this is sort of, I, I, I know we're, we're talking it through the lens of like, of, um, of like the context of AA um, and HPI and, and, and BIPOC communities, but it's just so pervasive right now that I think it's almost normal. So it's okay to talk about mental health. Now, the next question that we kind of, to I think, think about as a group and, and is what, what do we do now that it's okay? You know, for that, I think for those parents, as Kim had kind of said, they have that intergenerational trauma who now see, man, this last year was not, not normal. How do we um, not only invite people to be included, but how do we, I think, uh, as M was kind of saying, we're like, we're trendsetting a little bit here for future generations. How do we, how do we help, um, how do we help people with, um, like um, be, being okay with with talking about depression and anxiety and isolation and identity. Um, it's interesting just to kind of think about this. I, I know I, I talked too long, but seniors this year, seniors in high school this year, which is like kind of a, for maybe a lot of folks is like kind of a pretty important year. It's kind of a little bit of a culmination of like, you know, you kind of feel, they, they suddenly were college students because they were working remotely, you know, didn't have in-person school and didn't have the socialization and like leadership roles that they normally would have had. And, um, and kind of what impact that had on them to be prematurely kind of have that kind of experience taken away from them. Um, that, that's been across, that's like a cross cultural um, difficulty. So I, I don't know if that's specific to, um, to race, but, but now that it's normal to have mental health problems and, and to seek help. The problem actually, I feel like in some ways is there's not enough mental health providers. So I think that's why the kids are coming to me in, in some ways kind of, and I say kids, but you know, parents too, like with, they can't get in to see a therapist. So I, I, one, one last thought about that too, is when people think about, you know, if I was to see somebody to, to talk about my experience of being mixed race, right? Sara, like that group that you're talking about at that breakout session where people were like, this is an identity group of mixed race. I would love to see a mixed race therapist. You know what I mean? Like a mental health therapist who can say, hey, I, I'm good for mixed race people. Like that's what I can identify. You know what I mean? Like that sort of thing. I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. <laughs> but how do you find <laughs> I know. I was gonna say, how do you how do you like create something that that works for everyone? Uh, any, anyways, I'm a little bit thinking out loud, but you guys hear where I'm coming from. Now, now it's okay. Like, how do we with Kim? Like, what do you think those? You know, what would those intergenerational parents say to their kids now? You know, it's okay to actually see a therapist. You just got to find one that's Asian. <laughs> <laughs> Try harder. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I. For, for this whole period, it was twofold. And I think they're interlinked. We had the pandemic and that came with that came isolation and worry. And then the whole racial reckoning piece to have those two diverge. I, I want to think there's an opportunity there that just was created circumstantially that with those two Venn diagrams coming together, it just, to me, ripped off the band-aid of all that we have masked as a culture, all that we have masked um, in our politics and society. And I wanna think that if we can come together thinking we have more in common than we, um, than is portrayed in, in, in the media, you know, I, I guess polarization sells. Uh, to get people to be afraid of one another, that's sexy. But the reality is we are all human beings and we've got to see each other's humanity um, because everything else was stripped away. We weren't busy, we weren't running on our treadmill. Um, and I would like to see that, that be a beginning of a discussion, of these discussions of seeing each other more for who we are, uh, not what we have or what we wear or you know who we listen to, um, to just make space for each other as human beings. Um, you know, it, it comes back to the spirit of Aloha, to respect each other. And um, 
and to talk to one another. I mean, I, I, I would love to have more of these conversations because we share more than we realize, you know? So that's, that's for me what this, it's crisis as opportunity to quote the teaching. Um, that this is an opportunity for us to, to take a step forward as, as Americans, as people, um, and uh, just to see our humanity in one another. That's my hope. Thank you. All right, our final question. We cannot have a conversation about mental health without addressing self-care. So how do, how do each of you take care um, of yourself and what advice in regards to self-care can you share with our audience? Um, so Kim, if you could um, uh, start us off again here. Okay, well, um, I would say that for me, um, art and culture have been my go-to. Um, so I have tried to educate myself musically, uh, through film, through literature, uh, by marginalized groups, you know, um, I want to say James Baldwin, indispensable at this time. Um, uh, Audre Lorde, indispensable. Gwendolyn Brooks, indispensable as a poet. Um, I also find walking in nature, you know, uh, for me, I find joy in seeing parts of our county that have burned and are regrowing. To me, that's a sign of hope. Uh, if you look at Annadale or um, uh, other uh, uh, park areas, it's a reminder that life continues even, even in the darkest times. Um, I, I got into gardening, you know, my plants have to live with me, but I'm growing food. Um, and that brings me a lot of joy because every day there's something new and different. Um, and examining institutional systems that um, where racism has played a role. It's amazing to me to look at banking, um, to look at uh, home ownership and home lending and policies that have been, the filibuster has racial origins. It blows my mind how much thought and care was put into these systems when it has to do with racism that I just never knew. I took for granted. Um, it, it, it is definitely, there's a lot of the fear of the others has been codified in our system. And I think they're all, all up for review, frankly. So I've tried to educate myself and, and and learn more because I realize how much I don't know. That's how I spent my time. Anybody else? M? You know, I, I really like, liked what you had to say, Kim, about um, lifelong, lifelong learning, um, I think is a, is a great trait that a lot of folks um, can really start whenever, um, you know, like we're here, we're here um, as, as, a a a a n h p i sorry i'm still getting used to that one um you know folks and we're we're sharing our experiences and uh to the folks that aren't um within our community you know like there there is countless um information out on the computer um out on the internet out um in in the streets in the restaurants in the food we eat experience our culture you know like take take and take the opportunity to learn about us and maybe you can maybe empathize with what we have to go through. Um, like people can do self-care to us, yes. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> but like by, by seeing us. Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in terms of other self-care too, you know, the, um, you know, there's a lot of importance in, uh, making sure you have a stable foundation, making sure you're drinking enough water every day, making sure you're eating at least one, two, two to three meals a day. I almost said one, um, <laughs> you know, making sure you're getting the right amount of sleep that you need. Everybody's different. Everybody has, you know, their own um, needs for their own body, but just taking, taking the time to find what you specifically need, you know? Um, and, uh, 
for me, self-care, I like, I like to read. Um, I like to go on walks. I like to be outside for at least 30 minutes a day. And I really try to hold myself to that because honestly, it, you wouldn't think about it, but in the long run, it really does wonders for your mental health. Uh. Mm -hmm. Volunteering. I, 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 I found myself, it felt great to volunteer giving out food. Um, you know, it just, it, it fed me to do that. So yeah, just getting outside mm -hmm. myself for a little bit. Being kind is contagious too. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely needed. And yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed um, volunteering at food banks too. And well, now, now that I'm going to have a little bit more time for myself during the summer to open up, I might be doing more of that. Sarah, uh, what, do you, um, what do you do for self-care? So I saw a thing very recently that I really, really resonate with, which is that, uh, you know, the, the best thing that you can do for your, your self-care is revolution. Uh, just like what Brian said a little while ago of like, it's normal to have mental health problems. Now, what? Um, like, I, I, you know, I, I understand what you mean. Like, I'm not saying, but like the fact that our world is so messed up that it's normal to have mental health problems. Uh, that's a problem with the world, right? That's not a problem with my uh, ability to take care of myself. To complete, like, I, yes, I should take care of myself, but also like, the world being that way is the problem. Um, and I think that that's like the part that really needs to be driven home, especially like for, for us as like, as a, a and NHPI, like um, what people don't know is like, we have the widest economic disparity of any racial group, which also means that like, you know, the folks that are doing great uh, you know, there's always this feeling of like, if you mess up, you're down here. And then the rest of us are like down here and we're having to like struggle and nobody sees that. Nobody sees us as, as like ha having those economic struggles, having those like uh, struggles out in the world. And, 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 and that's the thing, like uh, we have things to change and to fix and to, to like recognize in like what other people are going through like uh what people are up against and and I feel like you know uh that started to happen a month ago and and just dropped where like people started to understand what we're up against uh and and, and like I think that what what Emma's saying is like having people like come and empathize with us and seeing us that that is that is an important aspect of care um and yeah, in terms of like the thing that's most rejuvenating for me is just like getting together with friends and dreaming up what a better world looks like is like that, that is the best form of self-care to me. I love that. And I would have, have fallen short if I just asked for a spa gift card, but absolutely, <laughs> like it's a, oh, I love that answer, right? Because it just, um, you know, envisioning that better world for us and then being a part of it is just so, that is self-care, absolutely. Yeah, Brian, um, <sighs> your thoughts? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, you know, I, I think uh, we all, as Em was saying, I think to some extent, um, it takes a while to figure out how to answer a question like this too like it takes time uh and and a, a little bit of privilege um I, I think in some ways what kim had said about this sort of intergenerational trauma that wasn't there wasn't a lot of space probably or pause as as em was kind of saying to to have a whole lot of emphasis on self-care and this last year i feel like was one of those years where i think it it gave folks um a chance to pause to get off that train and uh, think about who am I and uh, what do I believe in and, and what do I need? What do I need in order to keep going? Um, I, I think that, um, boy, this is so nice to see people who are like me. Uh, this is part of self-care, I think, for me to, to know that you're not alone, uh, 
it's been a it's been a kind of isolating year medically uh so i know a lot of folks you know i think had had more time than i did this last year it was actually my busiest year professionally um and uh it's hard to explain explain that I think um, other than just the, the pandemic you know in a kind of general sense but for like those of us who are kind of like um, didn't didn't have a whole lot of time to, to um, reflect yet I, I would say yet I don't think we've even had a chance to really so I, I think that this is a nice start to be able to be amongst people who understand kind of some of the aspects of our of our lives that uh, are hard to explain, but it's almost like, oh yeah, you're mixed race, me too. You like, just like, you don't have to, automatically there's just like understanding of what that experience feels like. And uh, particularly with, as I think um, Kim was saying, this sort of uh, Venn diagram uh, overlap of, of where there's this opportunity here. Cause showing up in some ways, you know, as Sorrow's kind of saying too, like showing up, that is like, that is um, healthy for us too, because like uh, when you care about something enough to, in some ways even um, as like, you know, for, I think all of us kind of expressed a little bit of hesitation about coming to this tonight because like showing up, we, we may be a little bit vulnerable, but, um, but uh, just to be here together, I think showing up when you care about something uh, and uh, and being kind, as Emma was kind of saying, that, that contagiousness really does matter in all different areas. I think of being AA and HPI, um, asking about our food. That was what my sign said when I came to Healdsburg, you know, and, and karaoke. I miss karaoke. <laughs> but my kids, I think, maybe Kim can speak to it. My kids help me. They remind me that, like, um, maybe maybe one final thought on... on um, just race, uh, you know, that my, my four-year-old, he's on, a, and my, my seven and four-year-old are on baseball teams and I'm coaching them. And um, they just like each other because they're on the same baseball team. And I, I just hope that like, it, it's sort of, there's a little bit less focus on, you know, maybe there, maybe baseball is sort of more of an Asian language <laughs> or a Hawaiian where there's no genders, <laughs> no modifiers. People just like, yeah, let's go play and have fun, you know, and that reminder is really healthy for me for self-care just to be out there and, and, and not, not be thinking about a whole lot more about what we, what we're, what's different about it as much as what we actually share and have in common. As Kim kind of said that this is a fun, this is a fun crew to be part of. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Oh, what I, lovely. I, I wish you folks all aloha and, and, you know, soon we'll be able to actually get and have face to face time. I look forward to that. Me too. Yeah. So. Finally, finally got to to meet and chat with like uh, the person and and like hear about your mom. I've heard so much about you and your mom, like uh, from Noah. <laughs> oh, oh, I wasn't sure who you're talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, this is amazing. We, we are where I I live in. We're an intergenerational household. Um, my mom passed away in uh, 2019, but there's you know, five generations of us, but only there's three of us in this household. There were three of three generations in one household, because um, uh, that's that's how we do it. Uh, but thank you, no, I'm I'm so glad that Noah recommended that. You know, they thought I should jump in. So I'm happy to do that. Noah, if you're watching this right now, you're incredible, <laughs> <laughs> just like your mother. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, each and every one of you, Sarah, Kim, M, Brian, um, you know, for sharing all of your insights um, and contributing to this very important discussion. Um, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and thank you to the audience, um, you know, for watching us and being a part of this conversation too. And um, please stay tuned with further um, with further episodes um, that'll take place in June, focusing on our LGBTQ plus community. And we wish you all a very good night. Take care of yourselves. Thank you all so much. <laughs>